What makes pride? We've been taught that pride is sinful, selfish, arrogant, deadly, but we know better. Pride is not deadly, hate is. Hate is the violence trying to make us small, silent, invisible, extinct. Pride is the extravagant, unapologetic embrace of our wholeness. Pride is the affirmation of our humanity. Pride announces we are here on our own terms. And for pride to be real, it must confront all the hate that seeks to destroy. Pride must battle white supremacy. It must end poverty. It must uproot patriarchy. Pride must liberate, house, clothe, and build. I am Melissa Harris Perry, and this month I'm partnering with PFLAG, the nation's largest family and ally organization, to lead a series of conversations with BIPOC, queer, and trans folk who are organizing transformational work in our communities. Join us every Tuesday in the month of June on PFLAG.org. Welcome, I'm Melissa Harris Perry. And I'm your host this month for a series of conversations we are calling, What Makes Pride? Now, each week during the month of June, I will be joined by leaders who are tackling critical issues facing BIPOC, queer, and trans communities through advocacy, activism, arts, and what we'll call creative maladjustment. This week, we're discussing housing issues with Southern organizers who are creating new models to provide housing and sustain community among queer and trans BIPOC folks. But before we meet our guests, I want to start with a little reminder. Come back with me, if you will, to just over one year ago when our communities, our nation, and indeed our entire globe were in the midst of a near existential crisis. Now, take a look at this press conference from March 2020. This was the moment when the WHO declared COVID-19 a global pandemic. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? Seeing this video of WHO officials and reporters declaring a pandemic while not wearing masks. But seeing those maskless public health officials is a reminder of just how swiftly everything in our lives was about to change. Within two weeks of that press conference, COVID-19 infections reached 1 million worldwide and claimed more than 100,000 lives. The White House declared a federal state of emergency, and more than 95% of Americans were living under some sort of either state or local shelter-in-place order. You remember what social media looked like at that time, right? But while that was all happening, Jobs were evaporating, and American unemployment soared to a record 14.7% in April of 2020. And now, of course, we all know that this was only the beginning. COVID-19 has now claimed nearly 3.5 million lives, including nearly 600,000 in this country. But it was in this context a year ago of, of death, of economic devastation, that the Centers for Disease Control issued a temporary halt in residential evictions. Now, the order ensured that landlords could not evict persons for non-payment of rent. And it is not an exaggeration to say that staying at home was the most important thing that most of us could do to try to save ourselves, our families, our communities, and the world. But how can you stay home without a home? And how can you shelter in place without shelter? So by making housing at least temporarily more secure, the eviction moratorium undoubtedly saved lives. That, of course, is last year. Now we're facing a renewed crisis. Last month, a federal judge threw out the CDC's nationwide moratorium on evictions, saying that the CDC had overstepped its authority. And even though the ruling is on hold temporarily while the Department of Justice is appealing the decision, make no mistake, evictions will increase this summer. And we may soon face a pandemic of homelessness with consequences as brutal as COVID-19 itself. 
For example, in New Orleans, a legal aid organization saw its own eviction-related caseload almost triple last summer when the state's eviction moratorium ran out. And housing experts are bracing for an eviction crisis in Memphis, where local housing laws are already among the most lopsided in the nation, consistently favoring landlords over tenants. And guess who is at the center of this gathering storm? That's right, queer and trans folk, and especially BIPOC queer and trans folk who are living in the South. See, the Alliance to End Homelessness identified a critical shortage of shelters in Western and Southern states a full year before the pandemic even started. And the Atlanta Journal and Constitution conducted a study that found Black tenants living in predominantly Black neighborhoods were most likely to face eviction by aggressive landlords. Now, now, think about those statistics in the context of the long-term reality that trans youth and adults have long had the nation's highest rates of homelessness and housing insecurity. For example, a 2017 report by Chapin Hall at the University of Chicago found that LGBTQ adults had a 120% higher risk of homelessness compared to young adults who identify as heterosexual and cisgender. More than one in five LGBTQ people in the United States experience poverty, and queer and trans folks are far more likely to experience housing discrimination, including the common practice of turning away queer and trans folks from shelters, especially shelters that are run by religious organizations. One way to think of this is that queer and trans BIPOC Southerners are the minor's canary of American housing. It is the vulnerability of these communities that reveal just how perilous and deadly housing injustice really is. Joining me now to discuss a new vision for housing justice centered in the lives and needs of BIPOC queer and trans Southerners are Jesse Pratt Lopez, founder and co-director of the Trans Housing Coalition, an Atlanta-based trans-led and founded organization that actually began as a photography and grassroots crowdfunding project, working with chronically homeless Black trans women to find permanent housing solutions. And also joining me is Mariah Moore, co-director of House of Tulip, based in my beloved New Orleans. House of Tulip is raising funds to buy and restore a multi-family property to pilot permanent housing for TGNC people living in Louisiana. Welcome to both Jesse and Mariah. I am so pleased to have you both. So honored to have you. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So. Here's where I want to start. I, I just spent a little bit of time kind of laying out the the numbers, right? The percentages around, um, uh, you know, the experiences of homelessness, of housing insecurity, of poverty. And as much as I feel like numbers can help to give us a sense of the big picture, I also feel like sometimes the numbers uh, obscure the, the lived experience. So Mariah, maybe I'll start with you. How do we go behind the numbers of these sort of appalling percentages experienced by uh, BIPOC trans folk in particular in the South and talk about what the actual experience of homelessness and housing insecurity is? Yeah, I mean, I would just first like to say that, I mean, the numbers are much higher than reported, right? Because we can't actually capture accurate data uh, for number one, because we're not recognized in data collection federally. So it's very hard to know uh, actually what, we're, what you're dealing with unless you're on the ground in community, serving community. So, I mean, every single day, and I mean, I'm here in my office now at House of Tulip, you know, and every single day we run across our community members who are in need, right? So today, for instance, I was serving a beautiful, wonderful trans woman who was living in a tent, right? Uh, she couldn't get ho a housing resource anywhere because she had to prove that she was homeless, right? So how do you prove that you're homeless? Do, do you invite them out with a camera to take a picture to say, hi, I'm actually homeless? Or how do you have someone write a letter for you saying that you're homeless when you're, you, are, you're, you are the only person that you have for support, right? So also folks that when we think about people who are unhoused, 
folks who are living in hotels are not considered to be homeless or unhoused. And that is a real problem, mm -hmm. right? Similarly, we have a lot of people in our community who are also what we consider to be couch surfing, right? So if I invite my girlfriend to stay on my couch, right, she's still considered unhoused or homeless because she doesn't have a dwelling of her own, right? Right, e right. even if she had a, a, um, a roof over her head last right. night, that doesn't mean that that is secure, stable, supportive housing. Mariah, hold for one second, you said something that I wanna pull in Jesse on, and that is you talked about having to prove that you're homeless, prove that you are in need. So Jesse, I wanna, I wanna use this as an opportunity um, for you to explain to us what housing first as a perspective on doing this work is. Yes, um, that was a great point that Mariah brought up um, that you know I've had to deal with in, in my work um, that the homeless industrial complex, you have to prove that you're homeless and that these, it's one of the ma many barriers for chronically homeless folks, you know, who don't have ID, who don't have access to the services, who don't, who aren't going to be able to make to make it to ten appointments in order to prove that they're homeless, um, in order to access housing or even have the opportunity to get on a list to access housing, and for trans folks, it can be even more difficult. So, housing first seeks to kind of remove a lot of those barriers, um, which is what really attracted us to really delve into that philosophy that's actually been around for 40 years and it's become kind of normalized. You know, we can, I think, you know, if we all say, you know, everyone deserves housing, you know, I think people can agree with that, but people aren't really aware of the, the, the reality of housing first, which um, it really just means that, you know, people deserve housing without preconditions, without barriers, such as sobriety. Um, you know, or having to jump through hoops to obtain housing. It was actually created by um, Dr. Sam Sambaris, um, who's the founder, um, he's a psychologist, and um, he, we actually have the privilege of working with him on um, our team. He's um, our advisor and he helped, works closely with our case managers. And Melissa, you'll actually like this. He, um, the reason, the way we were introduced to him is my father's a journalist. So he um, did multiple um, stories on Sam Sambaris, um, multiple interviews with him over 20 years ago. And when um, when the project started, he reached out to him and said, look, my daughter's doing this project, um, trying to solve, um, solve the problem in the trans community with homelessness. Would you be interested in um, helping in any capacity? And he's like, he instantly jumped right in and he's been with us ever since. And he's taught us a lot about the way that we're kind of programmed as a society even um, you know, working within the nonprofit industry or not, to kind of you know, we're kind of kind of taught to, that people have to earn their right, you know, for housing, for resources, um, you know, and we're kind of taught to use this punitive and like carceral system when people make mistakes when they, you know, are you know when they're not sober, you know, when they're when they you know aren't meeting the requirements of that society places on us, you know, you know that capitalism you know places on us to exist. Um, and you know, Housing First seems to un seeks to undo that, um, and that's why you know, with THC, we saw it as an opportunity to kind of start something, not reinvent the wheel, but just kind of apply something and put that, and kind of re redistribute that and put it on directly onto the trans community. So Jesse, I so appreciate this. Where I, I want to come to you on this, and Jesse, part of what I appreciate how you sort of. Um, you know, take that framework and say, you know, people shouldn't have to meet certain conditions like sobriety. And so again, I'll bring folks back to the COVID-19 moment. A, a, a year, right, an entire year when it became fashionable to on social media talk about how drunk you were, right, sort of across um, the, the angst of quarantine. And the point is that if you're middle class, if you're upper middle class, if you have plenty of resources, then you're allowed to be drunk and have a house as much as you want, right? Like the idea that substance use, and I'm not even going to call it abuse, substance use would mean that you deserve not to have housing is something that only applies to people without fewer, you know, with fewer resources. Those with plenty of resources, right, are actually um, perfectly happy to present the ways in which, right, um, wine or anything else, right, became sort of this tool of making it through COVID-19. So Mariah, another thing Jesse said that I want to come to you on, 
I've never heard um, homeless industrial complex before this moment, but boy, that nonprofit industrial complex in New Orleans is a real thing, um, and particularly in post-Katrina New Orleans. Can you talk to me about sort of trying to penetrate that space, right? All of the different kinds of nonprofits well, with, I, this, I think, with this particular work. I think the beautiful thing is that I don't have to try to mm. penetrate it, right? Because I've created my own lane and with House of Tulip and I don't have to play by the rules of the nonprofit industrial complex because I don't rely on them for funding and to, to, to source to source this this work. I rely on community and I rely on people with access who believe in the work that I'm doing to fund fund this work. Now, I have had wonderful support from uh, funding sources like the Greater New Orleans Foundation who have made it extremely accessible and have granted House of Tulip funding um, with very little hoops or paperwork right? Because they believe in the work that's being done because they've not seen anything like this before, right? But they've also been able to witness, right, the work that's being done, um, you know, and the great successes that we've had, right? So we bought a property, we have a rental property, we have an office, right? We are providing resources to community. They can drop in and get clothes and food, right? And apply for jobs. And so it's powerful what can happen when you just allow folks to organically do the work. Right. You know, I'm going well, back. Where Where is the property? I just want to sit um, in my head. Uh, well, we have a property that's located in the seventh ward. Right? ward? Yeah. I, I was on Miro between um, uh, Galvez and La Harp. So I, I'm a seventh ward. All yeah, right. Yes. Yes. Okay, not, all too right. Far, not too far from La Harp, actually. Yes, yes. Um, and then we also have uh, a property in the Bywater. Uh, yes. Yeah, and so in our office is in Mid City, so we're, it's kind of like almost a triangle, right? So we just mm -hmm. we're, we're we're spread across the city, but you know I go back to you know one of the toughest things that I will say is that even when you don't have to try to penetrate the non the the nonprofit uh, industrial complex, you still have to deal with the federal government, and the federal government makes it extremely hard for you to do your work, right? And so you know I'm in this situation right now where they're wanting information uh, about people that we've helped, you know, such as our undocumented community, right? And we know that that's yep. not safe. And I'm just refusing to give them that information because it shouldn't matter. The only people that I should have to answer to are the funders who gave me this money, right? And so there are a lot of variables here and a lot of things that we have to deal with when running these types of organizations. And now, you know, in the conversations that I have with other people who are involved in, in, in housing, you know, it's really hard. And that's why a lot of them choose to step away because there are systems in place that make it impossible to serve the people that need it. So, all right. So we've heard a little bit about what House of Tulip does. I wanna to come to you, Jesse. Talk to me a, a little bit about what um, what the Trans Housing Coalition does, because in part, when Mariah was talking about the sources of funding, right, this was always when I'm looking at organizations, it's the first thing I'm looking at, where is the money coming from? And I was saying to you in the green room earlier, I was so impressed that you all raised $2 million around the work you're doing. So talk to me a little bit about both what you do and how you find a way to do it. <laughs> Of course. Um, so yeah, the trans housing, it, it began as this mutual aid project that I started, you know, and that I think that's important to point out that queer and trans people, you know, historically have been, you know, creating our own resources, connecting each other with resources because we've been left out of, you know, the resources that are offered to the rest of society. Um, and COVID-19, I think, finally saw people, you know, a rise in mutual aid and I think it became more popular and became, which is beautiful and amazing to see, but like queer and trans people, we've always been doing it. So um, in my communities, you know, I've lived in every part of Atlanta, the North, the South, the West. And when I was living in Old Fourth Ward, I just um, met a community of black trans women that became I became really close with, you know, and they've been living on the street for over 10 years. Um, and it was, it was crazy to me because it's in this area that is rapidly with rapidly gentrifying, um, you know, people, um, the houses are getting torn down. The house that I lived in actually was torn down at the end of my lease. Um, and 
um, the city had just moved on. So I, you know, would hang out with them. You know, I kind of became, I became their mother, their sister, their, their case manager. I would take them, you know, to their um, medical appointments, make sure they were keeping up with their sexual health, um, you know, connecting them to resources. But then when I started doing that work, I realized there wasn't many housing resources for trans people in Atlanta. And the people, you know, that were doing, um, that were trying to, that were doing the work in Atlanta for um, trans people weren't getting funded, you know, didn't have access or capacity to help the the large amount of trans people because Atlanta is you know the queer one of the queer and trans capitals of the South you know people flock to Atlanta from all parts of the South and you know the city and other organizations aren't investing enough in in our communities so um, yeah so it, it was a long it was a long struggle because it was just me at the beginning but then I tapped into you know the vibrant community of Black and Brown organizers in Atlanta that have been doing the work you know. You know, and once the fund um, went viral and in June of last year, I realized this was a once in a life an opportunity to actually, you know, create something sustainable. So, you know, I created a community advisory board with, you know, these organizers from all these organizations and um, decided that, you know, to create something sustainable, we needed, you know, a trans led organization that was focusing specifically on um, on funneling these resources to the trans community and working directly with them. Um, so I, we instantly, because of the pandemic, we instantly were just decided we needed to house the communities that, you know, the girls that the project was, um, started with and for, um, the, the girls that had photographed, um, you know, we needed to house them. We needed to, you know, cause they were disproportionately, um, affected by the pandemic, you know, survival sex work was even more dangerous in the pandemic. You know, the girls have kept working, of course, you know. But they're, you know, putting their bodies on the line, um, you know, uh, contracting COVID, you know, being and a lot of them being immun immunocompromised, being, living with HIV. Um, so we decided it was important to house them. You know, we haven't, you know, and the housing market in Atlanta is ridiculous, you know, right. And, and in yeah. 2021, um, house, prices have gone up 20 percent. Um, so, you know, in the first six months, um, we had to house folks in um, extended stay hotels, you know, like many, you know, organizations do until they find permanent housing solutions. Um, and then, you know, through partnerships with different um, and with different organizations, um, we were able to start connecting folks to permanent um, um, uh, housing solutions such as housing vouchers. Um, so Atlanta has a lot of housing vouchers, but a lot of trans people don't ultimately end up getting them um mm -hmm. for many reasons so luckily we um with our second case manager we were able to um that we hired we were able to um connect folks um with those housing vouchers through the city of atlanta and an um, organization called partners for home um so we were that's one of our um, proudest accomplishments that we, you know we were able to get girls that have been on the streets for several years, you know, finally into their own apartments, you know, they don't have to worry about rent for a year and they can focus on finally living the lives that they want to lead. Um, and all while, you know, our case managers and all of us are working with them, you know, to connect them to, do, do, to live their lives. So it's been a learning experience and every day. <laughs> um, but so it's fulfilling. Just as I'm listening to you speak, I'm I'm reminded that um, that part of the way you tell the story, even of the founding of the organization, is by saying in the trans community we are each other's elders because mm -hmm. many of us don't have anyone to support us. So as you're telling that story about becoming uh, sister, mother, caseworker, right, having to make the partnerships, right, I I just um, I felt like you you gave a lot of context to that. Um, to that description of being one another's elders. So I want to, yeah. I want to, I want to pick apart or or try to get you all to um, frame up for me um, in a way that. So I almost hate to do this. I feel like I'm asking you to be like uh, uh, cis straight whisperers, and I don't want you to do that. But I do want you to help us think about the ways that sometimes. Times, it's, when you start talking about the issue of gentrification, often what will happen is this kind of binary discussion, especially among Black folks in urban and particularly urban Southern communities, and they'll say gay communities, by which they mean um, middle class uh, white gay men are gentrifiers, right? They are communities, they raise housing prices and displace Black folks. 
And typically, like sort of that discourse ignores a much broader queer community that includes trans women of color who are in fact at least as vulnerable and often far more vulnerable, right, than existing black communities or are within and part of those, those black and brown communities. So as you all are doing this work, are you bumping up against any of that like angst around how the binary nature of these conversations is sometimes framed? Uh, <laughs> Mariah, you, you have a look on your face, but also like maybe I'm a little reticent. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say this is that, you know, as you mentioned, um, it's we're not included in, in these conversations, um, nor are we in the collective vision for the movement to end the gentrification or to push back against gentrification. Um, <clears throat> One thing that I made sure uh, that House of Tulip did was to buy a property in a historically Black neighborhood, right? To rent a property in a historically Black neighborhood. Before we bought the current property that we had, we were uh, in, under contract to buy a home from uh, um, a Black seller, mm -hmm. right? So as we're doing this work, we also have to be mindful about the ways in which we are we are also moving to prevent gentrification, right? Because there's a lot that we can also do even though we are uh, worked against to be excluded from these conversations, right? To be excluded uh, from the overall end goal, right? Whether it be for gentrification or against gentrification, right? Whether it be for removal or uh, for, um, um, for implementation. So we're never uh, spoken about in these conversations, uh, whether it be at a community level or at a local state or national level in terms of government and policy. Um, so we just have to be very aware of this. We have to educate ourselves, right? While also simultaneously educating everyone else. And I think that one of the biggest takeaways for a lot of people here in New Orleans was that, you know, hey, this organization is doing great things. But they're also helping to pre preserve the culture of our neighborhoods and our city. So while they're also loving their community, they're loving their city and the people and the, the people who ultimately built it, right? Through the blood, sweat and tears. That's black folks, that's um, you know our Latinx community who gave so much back to New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. And we would not be where we are if it had not been for the skill set, the expertise and the love and the shared love that they had for the city. And so honoring that, the ways in which we honor that is to also preserve Right, what is being taken away. And so that's what I'm doing here. All right, I love how you told that story about Latinx um, contributions post Katrina, because again, it took a while to get to telling the story that way. Initially, right, it was told as a story of economic competition. Uh, you know, the city has drowned and now we are, we're facing a problem with them taking our job. And it just, it took a while for us to get to a place, right, where, where we're not having these zero sum um, conversations about what is possible. And it certainly seems to me, Jesse, when you make the point about housing first, right, that this was a, a, a concept, right, three decades back, not framed initially for uh, uh, BIPOC trans uh, folk of color, right, in the South. But once you do it there, right, once you start to solve all the set of, of um, housing and security issues for the most vulnerable, right, it, then it begins to create like the possibility, oh, housing first for everybody. Oh, right. Human right. Like, I'm wondering if there are other parts of the work that you're doing because housing never stands alone. You've already talked about survival sex work. You've already talked about um, access to health care. What are the other pieces, right, of sort of permanent supportive housing that you find yourself either on a city level or on a community level working on? Hmm. And Jesse, maybe we'll start with you and then Mariah, I'll ask the same of you. Sure. So yeah, speaking, expanding on housing first, it's definitely, you know, housing and then, you know, and then some. It's not just housing. It's, you know, housing and then the wraparound services, you know, needed in order for folks to, who have been living on the streets for years to get back into society and not be necessarily to be productive members of society, but, you know, be the members of society that they want to be and do what they want to do and not have to, you know, 
struggle every day to survive and not be actually, you know, living their lives. So, you know, we definitely have um, seen how difficult it is for folks, you know, who have all this trauma, who are stuck in survival mode every day to kind of make that transition um, back, you know, to, to before they were, they had to live that way. Um, but, you know, having that, the therapeutic relationships, you know, with case management, you know, with ideally case management of people with lived experience, um, with, you know, people of trans experience, um, is just as important as housing, you know, it, cause it, you can put someone in housing, but if they, if they don't have, you know, that support, if they don't have that, um, continuous support, they're, you know, they're going to go right back on the streets. So, you know, we've definitely, we've definitely learned that. And, you know, our case managers, you know, um, are, hold our, hold it down every day with our girls. And it, it, it's very difficult, um, for folks, you know, who have been left behind, who have been forgotten to kind of undo all of that and unlearn all of that. But, um, that is, you know, very important to note that a lot of people, you know, don't consider, you know, what happens after, because a lot of nonprofits, you know, they may have, you know, may house people, may be able to connect people with housing, but then they, they cut them off right there. You know, they, for, you know, they move on to the next person because it's about numbers, you know, you know, we work with, you know, with, um, other organizations, you know, that are uh, providing case management, um, for some of our clients who are getting the vouchers and those organizations only check in with their clients once a month. So it's like without, you know, how is that going to get anyone anywhere? We know you, they hear from you only once a month and the rest of the month is crickets, you know, what do you, you know? So luckily, you know, we have that, you know, ongoing mm -hmm. support, you know, with our girls and, um, that we, you know, we try to work with them every, every day, every week to try to, you know, like I said, do all the things that they want to do. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. I, I, mean, I, also, I also love that, you, that you've that you reframed it. So you're not saying productive members of society, whatever that's supposed to be, but rather, right? Right. That, that we should be able to fill who we want to be, right? Whatever, whatever that is that we're producing. Mariah. Yeah, I mean, similarly to what uh, Ms. Pratt said, it's like, you know, basically we want folks to be able to grow into the vision uh, that they set forth. So working towards that, how are we supporting that, right? We're housing you, but we can't just house you. We also have to provide that support. One thing I want to touch on that you mentioned, Jesse, is that sobriety, right? And we know that, you know, sobriety is a huge issue, right, in our community, right? I am... Uh, a, a one or one glass a day wine drinker after work i have to have it you know I, and that's something that i choose to do right but you know there are folks in our community that you know that struggle with much deeper uh sobriety issues like with hard drugs with alcoholism you know and all these things and so while we we definitely don't ever want that to be a barrier to housing we also have to know that in order to provide a space that accommodates folks navigating sobriety, we also have to also provide the support for them to work through that, right? And I think it's easier to place folks in single living spaces, which what you said, it's easy to place folks in single living spaces that are actively navigating their sobriety versus a communal living space like House of Tulip, where you have your own room, but shared spaces, right? So then when we talk about going a step further, one of the things that we have to consider is like, okay, we want to definitely support folks who are navigating sobriety, that we don't ever want that to be a barrier because we are zero barrier housing. But what are we putting in place to support that? Also for other folks' safety, right? right. Um, so we think about that often. And we, similarly to your case management, we have our case management. We have connections to 12-step uh, programming. We have connections to get folks into uh, rapid health care, right? Um, we had an incident today, right? A woman dropped in. She needed a chest x-ray. She didn't have an ID. We had to go get an ID. But because we have the flexibility to just jump into it and do it without all of the paperwork and the approvals, we are the ones who make the decisions for our communities, right? Mm -hmm. And so we are able to provide the best care, right? Because we don't have to have approval from the system in order to say, we can cover that because it's necessary, 
right? We can cover that. Um, you know, people die because they don't get the things that they need, right? And so the beautiful thing, you know, about House of Tulip, and I'm sure the same uh, with your project, is that we have we ha we have that decide we have that decision making body here on site. We can jump into it and just provide whatever it is that we need. If someone is having, you know, it's going, they're going through a a, a, a a tremendously tough day with their mental health, we have therapists on call, right, who can respond to it quickly, right? You don't have to wait till next week, right? You don't have to, you know, it doesn't have to get to the point where some other body gets involved and then someone ends up getting hurt, like we've seen so many times, right? So we actually have the power here, right? to create these safe spaces with the services that we provide, right? And so like similarly, we, we provide not just housing, but the entire wraparound service. Once we house you, we're not gonna leave you hungry, right? Once we house you, we're not gonna leave you without clothing. Once we house you, you're not gonna be without a telephone, right? Or lights or water or internet or cable. You're gonna have all these things that you need because we want you to thrive, right? And we don't want you to stay in this scarcity mindset, right? That a lot of our community members are in, right? Scared to ask for things because if I ask for too much, they're gonna ask me to leave, right? Mm. This is not, this is not what this is, right? So we just mm. and also want to stress this: we don't have a blueprint for what how we operate. We take every day one day at a time, right? Yeah. We start at nine and we may go to 9 p.m. We may go to 11, right? But we take it one day at a time and we treat everybody as an individual, right? We don't have a blanket system for everyone because no one situation is like the other. There may be similarities, but we can't treat people as a number. We have to give people individualized, conscious, respectful, dignity-centered care. Mm, I just want to sit with all of that for a second. And where I may be, um, I mean, I, I just want you to know, this, I can see my producers making notes as we're talking and uh, folks basically started text weeping as you were talking. And I think for me, um, when you said that fear of asking for too much because they'll ask me to leave. Right, because that's that's what family is meant to be. You can ask for like you can ask for e everything ridiculous, like and the love will always cover you. There will always be a place to come home. You actually can't ask for too much. And so if I if I connect Jesse's point about not having people have your have your back, not having your elders, and then providing a space where you can't ask for too much, um, that is certainly about housing. But it feels to me like it's also about so many other things. As we wrap this conversation, though, I want to um, I want to come back to one more thing you said, Mariah, which is people die because they don't have the things that they need. And so, what I want both of you to do is to tell people who are watching where they can find you, what it is that your organization needs, and how it is that folks can provide it. So, Jesse, I'll start with you. Where can people find you? What are you working on right now that you need? And what are some of the things that folks who are watching can actually provide? Of course, um, thank you. Um, you can find us at transhousingcoalition.org. Um, right now, we're really working, we're working through a lot of transitions, but we were just recently purchased a property in Southwest Atlanta in Hapeville, um, a small multifamily that we can use as a home transitional base for our, some of our girls. So um, we're working on navigating that. Um, and um, find building that into a home, making a space for gardening, gardening to have some therapeutic activities for the girls, and we're looking to also, um, hopefully, um, also get a multifamily um, if we can navigate this um, housing market in Atlanta. So we really um, could use support with that. You know, if, um, navigating the um, ridiculous zoning and um, uh, first uh, zoning and um, housing laws you know that we've been dealing with um over the over the last year it's been um, a constant back and forth struggle um you know navigating that so but yeah we have come out so far and we appreciate all the support from everybody and thank you for giving us this platform 
So I, I love that you, you, by saying that thing about the housing laws, you reminded us again, uh, again, it's Atlanta, it's in New Orleans, but let us not forget, Atlanta is in Georgia. Mm -hmm. New Orleans is in Louisiana. The state legislatures who make the rules around so many of these things are, I, I mean, the, the, the victories you managed to get are stunning given uh, the, the very aggressive um, political situations you find yourselves in. Mariah, where are you? Where can people find you? What is it you're working on that you need and what can people do? Yeah, well, first I wanna say, Jesse, keep pushing back against those zoning laws because I found a loophole. Just really quickly, this is very significant. They told us that we could not house more than four people that were unrelated. And I told them, well, what do you all do about the frat and sorority houses? None of them are related. How can they live together, right? Yeah. So there's always there's always something there that you can use to get through. So don't ever give up and continue to push back against them. They'll crack, trust me. But anyway, so. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> So the frat industrial complex is coming the down, right? With the homeless industrial complex. Right, Let's because it, it literally it is down. a double standard. You uh -huh. can't do it because you're poor, but they can do it because they're rich. Right? And they don't have to prove they're sober either. Uh, they don't have, right. So we can be found at uh, www.houseoftulip.org, H O U S E T U T U L I P dot org. Um, we can also be found on Facebook at House of Tulip, Instagram, House of Tulip NO, and Twitter, House of Tulip NO. We need uh, monthly recurring donors, right? That is our mission and our vision is to have individuals that give to us, that sustain us monthly. We know that we can't do this work in a transformative, progressive way if it's governed by federal bodies, right? If it's governed by uh, city and state officials, we have to be the ones with the true lived experience that do this work. So whether it's a dollar a month, a $5 a month, whatever it is that you can give, we would be so grateful if you would consider be, becoming a monthly sustaining donor to our organization. We are also working on our, our backyard healing oasis, which is gonna have a water fountain and some nice uh, cocoon chairs, right? With the big tenting over it, it's in back of the property that we already bought. But we're also going to be looking into an apartment complex because we want um, our community members who don't necessarily need the communal living situation. Mm -hmm. We want them to have that single living space that they can make their own. They can do whatever they want in that space. It's totally theirs, right? Uh, and so that's the next step into our process. And then after that, we move on to our home ownership piece, right? So, you know, we're moving in such a brilliant and beautiful way that we, that's ne it's never been done before, right? And we're, a we're only able to do that if people who believe in this work, who believe in the power of people being allowed to have self-determination, right? We can only do this if individuals who believe in that fund this work. So, you know, continue. You can call me anytime. I, I sit right next to my phone, you know. <laughs> with, with your Lysol and your tissues. That's really my favorite thing in the show. Don't play with me. But yes. <laughs> but yes. Oh, I, out here. Listen, I am here. It's real. <laughs> it's listen. But no, for real. And on a serious note, it's like, we both, we both um, came into this work and we kind of catapulted here around the same time, you mentioned June, it was June for me as well. And, mm. you know, this is tied to me personally because I've experienced everything that, everything that the people that I've come into contact with are experiencing, right? I've experienced being unhoused, right? And can very well be unhoused again if I miss a paycheck, right? I know what it's like to be engaged in survival sex work. I'm a former sex worker myself. I've experienced anti-trans violence, right? I have rods in both of my legs, right? I experience that chronic pain every day. I know what it's like to, to ask for that, that piece that I was talking about, asking for too much, right? Because by me having to take care of myself 
every single day of my life for as long as I can remember. I've never had anyone I could ask for anything. And oftentimes I'm scared to ask for too much. And sometimes that's a, that, you know, that can that can translate negatively, right? When we get into a, a job, on a job, right? We can overwork ourselves because we're scared that if we don't do enough, that we'll be let go, right? And the beautiful thing about this is that I have the opportunity to break that cycle, right? Through that transformative radical love, right? Letting folks know that, you know, you are right where you need to be and, and just brilliant being exactly who you are. Right. And so, you know, this is what we're doing. You know, it's fulfilling. It's a lot of work. It's not easy. Right. And it really takes it really takes lived experience to be able to do this work every day meaningfully. So thank you so much. I can't tell you how grateful I am, um, Mariah, Jesse, for uh, for joining me, for lending your voice to this um, effort, but but even more than sort of, you know, this time that, that we've spent together for just doing this work um, in this, you know, relatively brief conversation, you've taken us through how your work intersects with uh, an immigration, uh, set of immigration policies that seek to, uh, not to assist folks who are crossing borders, but rather to to, to identify and, and push them out. You've, you've talked about the, the rules that we set up around uh, IDs and determination of identity and whether you've, you've talked about the entire complex of social services and the ways in which we actually, again, set up these barriers. But I, I think perhaps more than anything, you've given voice to the ways that um, we have a tendency to reduce human beings into either numbers or um, cases. And I, I just so appreciate that in every way that you've spoken, you've given us back some aspect of humanity uh, and of life. And uh, I, am, I am exceedingly grateful for the work that you're doing. And I promise uh, you will be getting some monthly sustaining donations. They may be small, but they will be coming from the Perry household uh, because we appreciate the work, uh, Jesse, that you're doing and Mariah that you're doing. Thank you both, uh, Jesse Pratt Lopez of Trans Housing Coalition and Mariah Moore of House of Tulip for joining me today. And up next, we're gonna have some original music by Tomu DJ. Now, Tomu DJ is an American producer and DJ, best known for her groundbreaking self-relief projects on Bandcamp. And you can find and follow her work at T-O-M-U DJ, Tomu DJ on all platforms. Stick around after our music break. I'm gonna have a few final thoughts and a preview of our next episode.
And that's it for this episode of What Makes Pride, brought to you by PFLAG, the nation's largest family and ally organization. I'm your host, Melissa Harris-Perry. Thank you for joining us. And remember to tune in for next week's episode when we're going to take up issues of incarceration and criminal punishment. Now, to learn more about our guests from this week's episode and also from last week's episode, be sure to go to pflag.org. There you will learn more about how to support all of their critical work. You'll find links, suggested ways to be in contact, and to stay involved. All right, everybody, stay as safe as you can. Take a cue from Mariah. Keep your tissues and your lights all close. Be good to one another and have a little pride. <laughs>